welcome to the Horror Hangout a podcast, where film fans watch the best and worst horror movies of all time and talk about them. Today's episode is a bonus special episode, chatting all about a new non-fiction book horror book release. My name is Ben Errington, and today I am joined by a very special guest. Ariel Power Shorb is a horror fan from womb to tomb, horror film critic and analyst, plus the author of Millennial Nasties, analyzing a decade of brutal horror film violence which is published on the 17th of September through Encyclopocalypse Productions. That's a mouthful. Welcome, Ariel. Hello. Hi, thanks so much for having me. You're most, most welcome. Thank you so much for joining the show. And first of all, congratulations on the book, which is just a couple of days out from being published. And I guess when this episode goes live, it'll pretty much be... It'll be be out. It'll be out, (laughs) exactly. So congratulations. How are you feeling? Thank you. Um... I feel great. I sort of swing back and forth between like, it's really surreal and I don't believe it's happening to like super happy and excited. So you can catch me kind of in the middle of that at any given moment. Somewhere back, smack bang in the middle. Yeah. Um, Sounds about good. Am I right in saying that this is your first published book as well? Yes, that's right. Wow. I mean, extra congratulations then, because that is a huge, huge milestone. Um. Wonderful. I mean, before we get started, here are some details for our audience on the book. Millennial Nasties takes a critical but appreciative look at the often ignored subset of horror. This book dissects the English language horror films of the 2000s and the cultural events that were responding that they were responding to. Films once dismissed as torture porn, their nasty slasher friends and the remakes of this era have found a new home. And that home is a subgenre called Millennial Nasties sums it up nast- nicely doesn't it oh so that sums it up nastily which i guess it does as well <laughs> yeah well hey um obvious and obviously you being involved with generation terror the documentary as well mm-hmm. those two things kind of happening at the same time is that just coincidence it was like yeah. how yeah. lucky for me um generation terror the sarah reached out to me the direct one of the directors reached out to me after i announced publicly that Encyclopocalypse had signed me for this book. And so I was out there on social media excited about this book about 2000s horror that I was writing. And then the director reached out to me and said, hey, we're doing this documentary. And I was just like, how is this possible? Like, pinch me. So yeah, totally unrelated projects that I just happened to be lucky enough to be involved in. Amazing. So they're just like, right, we're making a documentary about millennial horror. And then suddenly, bang, this, I'm writing this book, and they were like, well, we absolutely must get you involved. I um, guess, yeah. Yeah. Fa- I mean, it's fascinating. How, do, how did you sort of get involved initially writing about horror movies? Had you, had you kind of yeah. like been writing for websites and publications and everything like that? Yeah, only for a few years now, which is sort of crazy to say. Um, I got my start with Ghouls Magazine when that got its start. So right around the time Zoe and Rebecca were starting Ghouls, I pitched a piece to them actually about the Saw franchise. And that was really the first thing I had ever written in terms of horror analysis and like pitched it anywhere. Um, And they liked my pitch and they took me on. And then I kept writing for Ghouls throughout the whole time. And that led me to some other publications like Moving Pictures and Certified Forgotten and Hear Us Scream. And so as I was writing for all these sites, I kind of was thinking, like, maybe I have enough to write a book. And so that's kind of how that started. And was like this era of horror, was that always your target? Did you always think that that, if you're going to write a book, it was kind of going to be about this era of horror? Yeah, this is where I tend to gravitate to. And it's an era I always enjoy Plus, I it had the benefit of not really having a lot of analysis yet. So it kind of felt like a perfect niche to look into because there's lots written about like the 70s and 80s and rightly so. But this decade hadn't been given a ton of attention yet. Um, and it kind of started as I thought I might write a book about the Saw franchise because that's my absolute favorite. But as I was getting my thoughts together for that project, I realized I had a lot to say about sort of some of the adjacent movies and movies that Saw influenced and what was influencing Saw. Um, And that's how it grew into a book about the whole decade. 
So it's the whole decade. Is it kind of like breaking things down year by year or do we kind of like go all, I guess, is it like thematic? We kind of go in one direction and maybe come back a bit. Is it kind of a bit more like that? Yeah, so it's more thematic. Um, there are three sections in the book. So I kind of talk about the tentpole millennial nasties, original slasher franchises, and then the remakes of the time. And in each of those three sections, there are chapters breaking it down into further themes. So I in the sections of the book, I'm kind of going chronologically, but throughout the book, we're jumping around years a little bit to talk about particular points and um, themes that we saw throughout. Mm. I think that's usually the best, isn't it? Because I think when books and do even documentaries, to a sense, when they break it down by year, it's kind of it's much easier to kind of go. We're talking about this film, but let's just quickly go forwards to this one because it mm -hmm. directly influenced this. I think when you go year by year, you kind of lose the the kind of train of thought up slightly, can't you? Um, yeah, that's what it. And I thought I might end up repeating myself a lot if I went year by year, whereas if I went thematically, I could kind of make my point and then move on to my next point. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what was it particularly, sorry, about this era of horror that you felt you had so much to say about? I mean, you make a good point there where you say, like, there isn't a lot of analysis about this era mm -hmm. of horror. Is that because it still feels so, it feels so recent, doesn't it? Even it is like 20 years plus yeah. ago. It feels so incredibly recent. And in that way, a lot of analyzing stuff feels a little bit like it hasn't earned it just yet. But yeah, I guess we kind of are. It kind of does make sense that we're looking at the the this this um decade already, doesn't it? It's it's a delicate thing because you want enough time away from the time period to look back at it and see its place in history. You know, if I tried to write about the horror movies of the twenty teens right now, I might not have enough distance to see all the influence that that they that will come from mm. them. Um, so I think maybe we're just getting to a place now where we can talk about the 2000s and, you know, Generation Terror is another example of that being like people going, okay, it's time. Um, I also think that there hasn't been a lot of attention to this decade because so much of it was dismissed. You know, mm -hmm. French extremity gets a lot of academic attention and rightly so French extremity is great. And I don't go into that in my book at all. Um, if you want to read about New French Extremity, Alex West wrote an incredible book that definitely inspired me. So mm -hmm. you can check that out. Um, but like English language films in particular, the films coming out of North America and Australia were really sort of disregarded, called torture porn, looked down upon, especially as we went into the next era of horror that sort of came after this, where we started doing... Um, more art housey type horror got got bigger budgets so i think it's a mix of not having enough time from it yet and people not thinking these movies have anything to say has led to them sort of being ignored but i do feel like people are hungry for it now people are excited now to talk about this era and look back on it so i think it's time yeah yeah that, that makes total sense and i guess it's nostalgia as well isn't it because when you're in mm -hmm. it and all these films are coming out and you're enjoying them and they're part of your generation mm -hmm. you just enjoy them for what they are it's only with a bit of time away and as the years go by that perhaps you can look back at it from a different point of view um, yes yeah and i mean so 40 plus titles featured in the book was that difficult narrow narrowing it down did any like n maybe not make the cut were there any films perhaps perhaps that you that you feel like you included too much of or was it like a nice balance would you say it was difficult um you know i kind of started with a general idea in mind of okay we'll definitely talk about the saw movies and the hostile movies and the remakes but figuring out exactly which remakes and then what other movies from this time period i had a long list that kept changing i kept adding things and taking things off because there's lots of movies that could be in this book that aren't. And like, that's good. I think maybe someone else will write an analysis of those, or maybe I'll eventually write an analysis of those. But what I wanted to do was talk about what I thought the most important millennial nasties were that helped me make my points the best. And so there were movies I could have included that I think maybe would have supported some of my points. But again, I didn't want it to get too repetitive. Um, yeah. 
and I've had, you know, anytime you make a list of something, people come out of the woodwork to say, well, where's this and where's that? And why didn't you put this one? Um, So there's definitely ones that people perceive to be missing, but I will say I've thought a lot about this for a long time while I was writing it. And so the books I chose were purposeful Mm. and um, yeah, there's more millennial nasties out there than are listed in this book. I'm talking about sequels. Perhaps there could be a sequel to this very book. There could be. There could be. There could uh, be. <laughs> yeah, I guess pe- people's idea of what would make a millennial nasty is different. And yeah, you will always yeah. get fans who say, excuse me, I think you've <laughs> actually forgotten this one. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's Which, my uh... favorite. Forgotten. <laughs> While I wrote this intensely for over a year, I forgot. A movie. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Were there any moments in Generation Terror where... You were a bit like, oh, actually, I didn't mention that one. Oh, maybe I should have. Or, or, or the, or the, or the opposite, or the opposite. Maybe Generation Terror didn't include something that you thought was very, very relevant for the, uh, for the era. So Generation Terror, I think, does an interesting thing where they start in the '90s and they talk about the yeah. lead up to the 2000s, and I did not do that. And so, like, that's some really cool perspective that I didn't include. A little bit in the intro to Millennial Nasty is I kind of talk about where we're coming from in the 90s culturally, but Generation Terror talks about the films. Um, And so I think like they included some stuff that I definitely didn't. So I think it's a good companion piece. But um, Generation Terror was also covering a more global look than I am. And one of the reasons I kept Millennial Nasties to English language films only was because I thought if I made it a global project, it could really get away from me. Like the scope could be too big. Mm. Um, Yeah. There is a lot to say about movies that came out about around this time that aren't English language and that are from all over the world. So Generation Terror touches on those where I don't. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, I mean, people should watch that for sure whenever it comes out on streaming. I mean, you said it would be a great companion piece. These mm-hmm. these things should just be uh, bundled together, I feel like, for the most <laughs> definitive experience of, of this sort of era of I horror. would be open to that. <laughs> <laughs> I would be open to it. Mates, make it, let's make it happen. Come on. Um, <laughs> obviously, while we're talking about Generation Terror, I will also ask, like, how was the experience of seeing that on the big screen and doing and doing a Q and A afterwards as well? That must have been super fun. I was, I mean, I was in the front row. I felt a little bit yeah. like I was too close to the. <laughs> you know, when you just feel like I'm just, I feel You're like I'm just sat like this. <laughs> exactly, and especially during the Q and A, I feel like I'm just too close. It feels like I'm literally just like sat mere feet away from you, just judging everything you say. I wasn't doing that, of course. Um, yeah. So how how was that? Oh, it was wonderful. It was surreal. I've never. I mean, I've never seen myself on a movie screen before. Like, that was wild. And in the audience, so I was seated next to Zoe Rose Smith, your girl and mine, Zobo, we love her. And then on my left was Christopher Smith, who directed Creep and Triangle, movies I love. And on Zoe's right was Neil Marshall. And so I was just like, what even is my life right now? Like, I'm (laughs) with all of these, like, heavy hitters. Wow. And Christopher Smith was so nice. I mm. turned to him and I told him how much I love his movies. And he was just so kind and just talked to me like a regular person. Um, and then doing the Q&A was really fun, too. I kind of was like, eh, I'll do it. But what am I doing there? Like, the questions are only going to be for the filmmakers, understandably so. Like, what do people want to hear from me? Um, but people did have questions for me and Zoe and Amber mm. up there. So it was really nice. It was so fun. And just like. I kept telling Sarah and Phil, like, thank you for including me. Thank you for the opportunity. Like, what a once in a lifetime thing. I could, mm-hmm. I know I'm just gushing now, but it was just so nice. Oh my God, gush away. It was, you could, all, <laughs> even as someone who like wasn't involved, I could still, I could see the love and the attention that went into it. And I think yeah. that point, that point you make there, make there is that I feel like we're, we've reached a point now within horror fandom where filmmakers, but also, you know, writers, podcasters content creators uh, kind of feel like they're just as important in the in the realm of um movie discussion i guess so i think that you shouldn't um i think you should 
sort of appreciate that's you know what I mean sorry I'm, yeah, not, yeah. I'm wording it incorrectly I'm making it sound like I understand you appreciate but you see what I mean um, yeah it's um it's becoming more common to sort of cross those streams and bring more people into the conversation which is always a mm. good thing yeah yeah absolutely um talking of remakes as well so one of the questions was what is, what is your favorite horror remake of that era mm -hmm. can you remind me what your answer was for that the last house on the left last house on the left that's it with um jennifer lawrence is she in that no no yeah? what no. one am i thinking of i know the one that you're thinking of yeah what one am is i it thinking called, of is it called house at the end of the street or something like that okay <laughs> that is it i yeah. don't feel like I, I don't feel like i've seen the remake of the last house on the left Oh, it's so good. It it's really, really good. Um, you gotta watch it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I don't have to remind myself Arrow now. did a release that Zoe wrote an essay for. So if you get the Arrow release, our buddy has an essay in there. Yeah. Oh, Zoe's got an essay in, in everything these days. I know. I know. I'm not gonna I'm I'm not gonna feel satisfied with any film release unless it's got an accompanying book and <laughs> An essay written by Zoe in the, in the booklet inside. <laughs> Come on, let's do that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, just look I'm just looking. I don't think I've seen The Last House on the Left remake. So It's um, very good. It's very 2000s. I mean, it's it's yeah. very of a time. But so was the original was very of a time too. And mm. so like, it's interesting to compare the two and they're each their own. You can appreciate things about both of them. But like, I will watch the remake of The Last House on the Left any any day over the original. Yeah, the original is definitely a tough, tough old watch, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, yeah. And I, yeah, and I think something about early 2000s films when they're like kind of like the, the rape revenge thing or maybe like an exploitation thing that it feels very much of its time. That, mm -hmm. I don't know. Is it just because we 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 kind of grew up in that era that it's like feels less grubby? I don't know. It's weird. Maybe isn't it? and that's got to be part of it, you know, because I was coming of age along with these movies, and so this is what I had access to and spent a lot of time with. So I'm mm. gonna be more connected to it than somebody who watches them for the first time years later. Um, but I do think one of the things that is a hallmark of a millennial nasty is the heightened gore and it's an interesting uncanny valley because it's not realistic gore but mm. it's also not cartoony you know spraying chocolate syrup in the psycho bathroom like mm. it's something in the middle where it makes you feel you know sick and it makes you cringe and gasp but it's really unrealistic and so i think the type of gore that it is to me is very watchable because it doesn't make me bored the way like you know old timey gore might and but it also doesn't make me feel sick like i'm watching something horrible happen on the news so mm. i don't know there's something in there the middle ground somewhere yeah. yeah not like the ridiculous bright red blood of like maybe some jalo films or films right from the 70s and stuff yeah right i know what you mean um mm -hmm. so in terms of <clears throat> um I was going to talk about tropes of this era. Are, mm -hmm. are there any tropes of th of this sort of era, sort of mill millennial millennial horror, um, mm -hmm. that you are glad are dead, and mm -hmm. any that you'd like to see return that you think are per perhaps not done as much in modern horror, and you feel like they've probably still got a place. Well, one I'm very glad is mostly dead, although I feel like it's been creeping back. Um, the Edge Lord humor of the time <laughs> oh, i do God. not miss um yeah the the casual bigotry jokes at the expense of vulnerable people um homophobia sexism rape jokes sexual assault played as a joke all that stuff we can leave in the past um mm. that was very much of a time too and that wasn't just the horror of a time i mean think about like the teen comedies at the time had all of that mm. as well so it was it was really that's where we were at in the 2000s and that was a reaction yeah. to the 90s where we were acting like we had solved all the problems of the world especially in the united states um mm. so we were like well we solved all these problems now we can joke about them but that was not true so that can get in the bin 
something that I wish would come back. Um, you know, and I do think it is on its way back is the on-screen gore and violence. Mm. We've taken a break from that for a while and we've gotten some incredible films over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. Get Out, Hereditary, Midsummer, which do have their gory scenes. But now we're getting things like Terrifier. I have my blood and oh, fucking yes. gut shirt on. Wow. Um, the Terrifier movies, Evil Dead Rise, um, even the absurdity of the body horror in Malignant. I think we're on our way back to <laughs> yes. doing more on screen. And I'm very, very ready for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Without, without a doubt. I, I, saw, I, I re- rewatched... Not all of Malignant, but I did see that the the particular scene recently, just mm-hmm. doing doing the rounds, and I think it had turned three years old. And I was like, I should really re- rewatch this because I I remember at the time being like shell shocked by it and perhaps <laughs> not appreciating it, appreciating it as much as I should have. Um, I think it's fun, but I have a dead silence poster behind me. Of course, I think Malignant is fun. <laughs> exactly. There we go. I almost feel like because that film, it was a a twist that perhaps wasn't in any of the marketing for good reason. Yeah. But I think because of that, it felt like it was a very straightforward, traditional kind of like ghostly film, wasn't it? Something like that. Haunting film, sorry. Mm -hmm. And when it went in that direction, I was I was so ready for it. It was it was fantastic. So yeah, I'm assuming, I'm assuming so you're re- you're really looking forward to Terrifier Three. Incredibly. Oh, I can't wait! I cannot wait for Terrifier Three. Did you? Very excited. Are you? Have you been like watching all the trailers, or are you avoiding as much stuff? I'm as you avoiding can, the trailers. Yeah. I'm avoiding the trailers. I'm I'm one of those. If I really want to see a movie, I won't watch the trailer. Yeah. So October, sort of like the tenth of October, is that when it comes yep. out? Yep. Yep. We did we did manage to interview uh, Lauren Lavera at um, mm-hmm. Fright Fest Glasgow, but she was there promoting the film The Well. So I was like, oh, I kind of want to ask her about Terrifier, but I don't want to be rude because you've just been yeah. in this film. I don't want to just walk up to you and go, Terrifier free. So I think, <laughs> I think I maybe asked like one or two questions, but after that, I just went, not got on the head. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I was always unsure of Terrifier, and, but I feel like now, after watching, I think I enjoyed Terrifier two more than one. Now I think I'm looking forward to Terrifier three. Um, just crazy yeah. to think like a film like that is going to get like a big t- big cinema release as well, isn't it? It it's makes great. not it, yeah, it makes me it's so great. happy. Yeah, <laughs> people are going out of their way for it, and I didn't think the first one was anything that special when I first watched it, but mm. then I watched the second one like I don't know five hundred times and. <laughs> went back and watched the first one and I really liked it a lot more. Okay. And then I just very, a few days ago watched all hollows Eve and that's like, yeah. And I was like, this is good too. So I'm just all the way in for our, the clown lore now. I had no idea about, about arts um, involvement in that. Is it the same actor playing him in that film? No, it's a different actor. Somebody else. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole there's a whole backstory. So mm. yeah, now I'm all the way into it. Wow. My my mm-hmm. watch list is, is just growing exponentially. I know, that's always the way. Last house on the left. What else? All Hallows Eve. Um, I'm sure we have more. Um obviously we mentioned before about you potentially joining us for a future episode to talk mm-hmm. about a millennial nasty. It doesn't have to be a millennial nasty, but it kind of feels like it should be. Uh, so We'll we'll leave that with you. We'll get something in the in the de- in the diary for for, um, for the future. Are you um? Well, sorry. One more question. How? Mm-hmm. Why did you choose Zoe to write the forward for your book as well? Um. Well, for friendship reasons, I look up to her so much, and I just she was instrumental in giving me my start in writing, and this felt like a way to appropriately pay tribute to her. Mm. Um. But also because she's the queen of extreme. She's the one and only queen of extreme. And I'm not writing about extreme cinema, but it's something where I think like a person like Zoe who knows extreme film inside and out can take a look at the millennial nasty era and see the same things that I saw, that there was a value in them and they were worth analyzing and spending time with. And so She's a great writer. She helped me a lot personally. And she's someone who sees the value in the era. I thought she was perfect for it. 
Absolutely. What mm-hmm. a great, what a great answer. That, uh, that definitely covers that. Um, are you working on anything currently or next, or is millennial millennial nasties kind of taking up all your attention currently? The, <laughs> rele- the, the release of it. Yeah, well, it is taking up a lot of attention, but um, I also regularly co-host on a podcast called The Pod and the Pendulum, where we cover horror movie franchises, one movie in one episode at a time. And so wow. we're in the middle of doing The Fly right now, and then we're going to move into Terrifier. So if you want some Terrifier movie coverage, we're doing that soon. But yes. on their Patreon, I'm hosting... Um, uh, we're going through all the I Spit on Your Grave movies. And I'm hosting wow, that coverage. Okay. Yeah. Because a lot of pods don't. A lot of pods mm. don't touch those movies. And they're worth attention and discussion and just as much deep dive as any other franchise. So mm. I'm doing that on the Pod and the Pendulum Patreum throughout the fall. How many I spit on your grave movies? There are, are five. There? Five? Mm-hmm. Okay. On on this show, we had Vanna Taylor join us to do uh, I Spit on Your Grave original yes. versus remake kind of thing but i maybe i was aware there were more but so like what She's like three, three directs oh yeah absolutely um yeah. it she was a she was the perfect pick for for that mm-hmm. particular film as well um so three direct sequels to the main film is that there no there so in 2019 a direct sequel to the main film came out and i haven't seen oh, that yeah. that's called i okay. spit on your grave deja vu um but in 2010, there was the remake, and then there were two sequels ah. to that. Oh. Mm-hmm. I, feel, I mean, I guess covering covering these films on the podcast, I must have been aware of that at one point. But yeah, interesting. Yeah. And I guess that was kind of like, again, strange, though, that that was a 2010 to 2015 kind of trilogy. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. it feels very like 2005. Like you can move it back five years. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Vanna is joining me for some of those episodes. So, um, oh my god, she's getting she's getting absolutely typecast for. for I mean, this. she's so knowledgeable. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. And then in mm. 2025, I will get back into writing again. Mm. So oh, wow. we'll see where that Amazing. takes me. Um, well, I can't wait to check out Millennial Nasties. Really looking forward to Thank getting my you. hands on a copy. Where can our listeners pick up a copy of of that book? I'll put something yes. in the show notes for them. So encyclopocalypse.com. Uh, you can pre-order it there, or I guess if you're listening to this, it's not pre-order anymore. And you can purchase copies internationally. So um, you might have to scroll down on the page to find international options, but you can order copies all over the world. Or if you prefer an ebook, you can do that as well. And I'll have the link pinned on all my socials too. You can find me across all platforms at Ari underscore Hellraiser. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ariel. Thank we you. will um we'll put the links to the show uh we'll put the links to your book in the show notes, the encyclopocalypse stuff and your Twitter and everything. Um, but yeah, wonderful. Thank you, thanks again and congratulations again on the book. Um thanks everybody for listening. If you enjoyed the show, become a patron over at patreon.com forward slash horror hangout um we are on facebook twitter youtube instagram and patreon i've said that already i've <laughs> i'm not doing very well today are i don't know what's going on with you're me you're doing I'm, uh... great you're doing i'm great. doing great I, that, doing that great. is that is what i need just the, yeah. <laughs> i need the positive <laughs> affirmation is absolutely what i need um Good. but thank you so much again and uh, we'll see you on the podcast very soon thank you so much take care Bye bye <laughs>